Hi, so we're live. Everybody, our participants come in. I'm going to invite them. We're good. Okay. Well, now we truly are live. So thanks, uh, thanks for tuning in, everyone. I'm Kevin Taylor. I'm registrar and CEO of the College of Respiratory Therapists. Yeah, thanks for taking the time out of your day. Uh, so it's, uh, it's good to have a, a, a chat on on this bylaw consultation that we have out right now. Uh, special thanks to all the RTs joining us from outside of the province. So we're expecting about 50 people on the call today, which is uh, it's a good number. So as you know, uh, we're traveling around the province. Uh, we've got eight town hall sessions that we're holding, a variety of variety of places across the province. And that's really a good opportunity for us to meet directly with the members and answer the questions and concerns um, that are coming up and speak to them, speak to them directly. Uh, so uh, in addition to that, oh, we've had plenty of changes over the last number of years. So we've been taking the opportunity to, to talk about everything, basically uh, uh, an ask me session. So every, er, everything is wide open uh, and uh, hopefully you've been able to come to some of those. We have uh, five to go, so lots to go. But in addition, for those people that are not able to make it to the town halls, uh, that's why we're hosting two two webinars, two webinars, uh, one today and one in a week's time, Jess, about a week's time. Uh, so uh, the second one will actually be the full presentation that we'll use from the town halls. Today is going to be a little bit shorter, it's just to talk about the bylaws, so that's, that's what we're up to today. Uh, a couple of technical things, we do have a chat that you see on the bottom of your screen, so that's what you can use to enter any questions. Questions, if you're having troubles with audio or anything like that, send it in to us and we'll We'll do what we can on our end. Uh, it is being recorded. It'll be available on our website in a couple of days. Uh, there's a survey at the very end of this, so if you can hang on a couple of minutes and give us some feedback on how we did, uh, that would be very helpful for planning for the next webinar. And speaking of the website, so we've got a number of resort uh, bylaw consultation there. There's the feedback survey itself, and, and thank you to everyone that's already completed it, even those who have less than constructive comments for us. So at least you're engaged. Thank you. Uh, there is an FAQ section, and that's that's probably where most of your questions are going to be answered. We've been updating that based on the responses that we get in through the survey to date. Uh, so that's that's current, and of course then now the webinar is going to be there as well. Let me see why uh, why so many resources. This uh, is kind of a big deal, right? It's the first time that we've done this, so we've been putting time and effort into everybody. We're trying to be as open and, and transparent on this as change as we can. And, uh, and really, I mean, if you're talking about raising fees, no one's going to be happy. We know that, but hopefully, we can give you the information so that you can you can understand and be informed, and then give you feedback to the survey. So that's it. That's the preamble. So we'll we'll dive right in. So we you'll notice that there's a, a number of bylaw changes that we're doing this round. Uh, we we really made it the most sweeping cleanup that we've done to date. The vast majority of the changes in, in the, this proposed uh, you know, grouping, it's, 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 it's housekeeping. It's, we've added some definitions. We, we deleted some things. For example, uh, we added an image of the CRT to a seal. It was referenced to a seal. Uh, and everybody wonders, well, what's a seal? So we, we put a picture in there. So that's what that's all about. Um, you'd be amazed how many discussions that we have about what is actually quorum. So we pin down you know, what a definition of quorum that we'll be using. Uh, it's uh, some things just we, they're not relevant anymore. So there's a reference to a safety deposit box, which, as you may know, um, we have a, a number of reserves. We have to, and the reserves we keep that money in investments. Uh, in 1994, when the bylaws were written, it made sense to have a safety deposit box because you had paper copies of investments. And today's it doesn't make any sense. And we haven't used that safety deposit box in over a decade. So uh, we're getting rid of it. So I won't even touch on those. They're pretty self-explanatory as you go through the survey. So I'll leave, the, I'll leave those to you to do your homework. So instead, we'll focus on just a handful, those that uh, relate to either governance that I think deserve a little bit of extra um, uh, commentary. So the one that you see on your screen there now, uh, Article 1103, we're proposing to remove it. And as it says, all internal signature checks must be signed by, or reviewed by me. So the rationale for that being in there in the first place was that, well, all of our checks require two people to sign them. And the thinking was, what if those two people were in collusion and trying to make those checks out to their own personal account? Well, then this third person was really meant to be able to pick up on that. The problem with that is, of course, what if those two people got the third, pick the third person who was also in cahoots with them? Or even more importantly, that third person would have to really understand all of the finances and all of the details of, of what we pay checks for. So. You know, like our, our database vendor or our app vendor. 
Um, and that's not necessarily the case with an external person. So we're proposing to delete it, but it doesn't actually soften our financial controls because it, since this is obsolete anyway, we have better financial controls. What we do now is all checks are reviewed as part of our annual audit, which is done by an independent third body, and they give the report from their audit directly to council. So the, the, uh, the staff, myself, were not even involved in it. So that's a much better financial control, so hence we're proposing to delete it. We've added three articles uh, to really strengthen the governance. Uh, we have three different committees that use panels to conduct their business. That's the Registration Committee, that's the QA Committee, and that's Investigations, Reports, and Complaints Committee. And in, those, in the, in the uh, terms of reference for each of those committees, there's a requirement in the, for the panels to have a public member as part of it. So as you know, in the self-regulated model, half of, well, just more than half of all of the council members are um, elected. They're, RTs. The other half are appointed by the Lieutenant Governor, and that's to give us that balanced view so that sometimes if you're talking RT things, you get a little RT-ish, and the public members are there to be able to pull us back. So since we do that on our panels anyway, what we wanted to do was enshrine it in bylaw, so that's the rationale for that. The next is to just clarify who's who is active. But we used to have in our uh, in our articles pertaining to elections, it used to make a reference to um, those who could vote had to have an active membership. And that actually doesn't mean anything to us from a regulatory perspective. We have to actually name the, the categories of registration. So this isn't softening it at all. This is just clarifying that when we're really referring to general or certificates. So that's that's that one. General last two, uh, Article 3613, we're amending this, and uh, this one I wanted to speak to because I, I know when people read through this, what, what is this $5,000 assessment? So it's only used for those people that are applying to the college, and there's one of two conditions, either they didn't train in Canada, or they've been inactive or out of practice for, not inactive, they've been out of practice for a, a protracted period, let's say 15 years, and looking to come back. So. If you read our stuff, and you should read our stuff, it's, it's good stuff. <laughs> Stay informed. If you've been reading our stuff, you'll know that we've spent the last couple of years rebuilding our international assessment program. And we have a sort of a best of breed model that we presented on internationally. It's been really well received. When we first started developing that and launching it, of course, we had to put an assessment fee in there. So the first phase of this was where we assigned a fee. And the first phase really consists of two components. Uh, one is a paper review of the individual's background, training, experience, and so on. And the second is a structured interview where they, they sit down with, with two training reviewers and they, they, they talk through a variety of scenarios to understand the background that the applicant brings. When we had first developed those two sections, we had to pay costs. We set it at dollars. We've since expanded and completed the development of the program. And this, the third section is what we call the clinical skills assessment. And it's got 10 different clinical scenarios, a mix of OSCEs and ClinSim, that uh, are added in. And then we have a full picture. So we do a paper review, we do an interview, and then we do a, an actual demonstration of skill. So what we needed to do was make sure that this section of the bylaw that pins a fee for the assessment really was a better reflection of the overall program. A couple of reasons. One, we wanted to ensure that it was being done on a cost recovery basis. So the amount that we charged for it had to be high enough that it would cover variations in the program. And the second thing is for all the applicants that are going through this process, they need an opportunity to know what the costs are going to be so that they can plan. So we pin a max on this to sort of achieve both of those goals. And that's what this bylaw is all about. That's what the, so we capped it at $5,000. Another one, we've all been waiting for. Um, let's talk fees. Can I start off by saying, sorry, we have to raise fees. We're proposing to raise them from $500 to $620. I suspect you already know that. I mean, active certificates will go up as well, and they'll be uh, $100. Slide, please. So why? We're going to take probably 10 minutes to give you a fulsome explanation as to why. So you know, this is the first time that we've ever had to raise fees. So it's been 22 years since the college came in, and uh, by the time by the time that we actually launch of 2018, it's going to be 24 years. So if you do a quick calculator, if you do one of those interest calculators online, what you'll find is that the $500 that we paid in 1994 
It's equivalent to seven hundred and eighty dollars today. So that's not to say that we're going to have to raise the fee to seven eighty. But if you think of what the costs are, what cost five hundred dollars in nineteen ninety four now costs seven hundred and eighty dollars today. So costs have been steadily increased over time, and our revenue well, we really didn't change the well, we didn't change the uh, the fee. So that means that the gap between the two is steadily been closing, and as of 2017, we're in a deficit situation. We just can't outpace it anymore. So, you ask, why didn't we do this earlier? Well, there's really two reasons that have allowed us to have a 24-year run. Uh, the first is, I mean, honestly, we're, we've squeezed every last dollar out of our budget. Uh, we've become incredibly efficient, and we're, we're well run. I don't know if you can zoom in enough on this this uh, this graph. I'm able to reduce significantly some standard operating costs. You know, for example, we had a green strategy and we reduced our printing to almost nothing. And there was a time when we printed everything and mailed it, mailed it all out to the membership. So now there's no stationary costs associated with that. There's no postage costs and there's no printing costs. So that's a big reduction. So that's that's been a really positive move. You know, the other thing is we constantly uh, renegotiate our contracts, so we're getting better deals on photocopiers and just. Off, things that you need in an office, phones and faxes and all the rest of that. Um, some things that we have seen a bump in in the last uh, couple of years and that really we, we have no control of them. One of them is the credit card merchant fees. So this is this. when you have online commerce, you actually pay a fee uh, to use the for the privilege of using the credit cards. And that fee is charged to us. So that's been surprising year over year. And uh, we've invested a little bit more in the last couple of years in translation to try to ensure that all of our documents were available in both official languages. So that's that's been a little bump. But otherwise, we've really reduced costs and we're, we're, we're quite proud of that. The other factor is that year over year, one thing that we've historically been able to count on is an increase in membership. So we, we graduate 120 to 140 students in Ontario every year. And uh, in addition to people that migrate in from other provinces and people that return to practice that have been out for a while, it means that, you know, on net, considering those that drop off, either move out of practice or retire, we've seen an increase of about $100 to $500 each. That means that an extra $50,000 has been coming into the budget on an annual basis, which has allowed us to increase inflation. But if you think about it, as the principal grows, Two or three percent of the principal actually becomes a larger and larger number. So the the ability for us to stay ahead of the inflation curve, relying on our growth in membership, that's that's the big driver, and that's that's why as of 2017 we're going to be in a deficit. So many people have been asking why why so much? It's a 20 almost a 25 percent increase. We didn't. There's, if you have to raise money, you, you can do it in a couple of ways. You can do a lump, a lump increase, or you could do incremental. The challenge with incremental is that it makes it really hard to budget. Many of our costs are variable, and so we need a little bit of a buffer. You know, if you only increase it by say twenty dollars a year, if you get a big bump in in your investigations and cases, as we're going to talk about in a couple of minutes, it, it, you're going to run into a deficit again year over year over year. So it's just it's a better way to plan. The other thing is, you know, this is the first change in a long time, and ever. So, so I thought we did a little polling on this, and people wanted to put off another increase for another number of years. So what we're working on is we've done all of our cost projections, we figured out what we're going to need to cover for the next five to seven years, and that's the amount that we're asking for. Uh, no more, and not a, not a dollar more than we need. And so if we're reducing costs, kind of pinned what we think we're going to see, what actually is costing more? You know, the big, biggest driver for us has really been an increasing number and the complexity of the cases that we get. So this is, this is the last things, uh, with the costs broken down there. And um, basically, all, if you get a case, you're going to have legal costs, it's going to be investigative costs, there may be tribunal costs, and so on. So what you'll see is that there were seven. You know, on average, we usually have around 11 cases that, that we pursue. Uh, we had seven, but the costs actually went up. So that's reflective of the, the complexity. Last year, we had 18 cases, so practically 150% of what our baseline is. And it seems like every college, you know, we all talk, and uh, everyone's seeing the same bumps. So that's, that's been a driver, and you never really know what is going to come in on a year-over-year -year basis, which is why having that flexibility or having a bit of an envelope for budgeting is as opposed to uh, 
just given you over here. So two other things, you know, as compared to 1994, there really were only a, a handful of self-regulated RT jurisdictions in, in Canada. Now, eight out of 10 provinces are self-regulated, which means that as the profession becomes more sophisticated, you become much more involved at a national. So in the next two weeks, we'll, re we'll be releasing the latest version of what's called the National Competency Profile. This time it's a framework. So it's better than it's been before, but the document essentially lays out uh, all the foundational competencies that are going to be taught for entry to practice. So every uh, curriculum in every school across the country is going to be based off of this. So that's that's a, a, an important document. So that's some of the work that we do up there. Closely related to that are two agencies that carry out rotation programs and uh, develop and administer the, the credentialing exam that you know, most provinces in the, in the country use, and that's CORI and CBRC. As, we, as everything becomes more complex, we work with them on uh, uh, new standards, new uh, tools for them to better do their job, and so it's much more interplay with them. The last thing is, in 2009, there was legislation passed that essentially was labor mobility legislation. What it means is that if you're registered in one jurisdiction, you can apply and be automatically registered in a second jurisdiction without an additional assessment, which is, which is good. It's a, it's a good thing. The challenge, though, is if one jurisdiction or two jurisdictions have different standards for any practice, then it creates an imbalance. So you can have different levels of training with people registered at the same level. So we spend an awful lot of time trying to work through the complexities of that, and that's been a big driver for activity at the national level. So bottom line is, the more progressive a profession becomes, these are type, the types of things that come with it. And they're usually not seen by average members. So I would imagine that much of this is going to be new to most of you tuning in today. And then the last thing is there's just programs and projects. You know, our, our standards of practice are, are um, grossly out of date. So now that we have a new competency profile, we'll be updating those. We just recently updated the ethics and the uh, infection prevention and control guidelines. Uh, we had, you remember about November last year, we did a, a consultation on the changes to our, our uh, register. So occasionally, the government has initiatives they need to respond to, and an increase in transparency was certainly one of them. Um, there was just a report released by the Sexual Abuse Task Force, and that's going to have uh, a significant impact for colleges as well. So we're planning for the work that's going to come with that. So there's your general office supplies, running the business costs, there's the cost of running your council and your committees, all the statutory committees, and then there's these things. So that's put that all together and that's what it takes to run a college. Those are the, the costs that we're seeing. Now, some of the questions that we've been getting uh, both through the town hall sessions and uh, through the, the surveys are we're trying to address here. So we have a common question and I think it's a good question, a fair one, and we definitely wanted to respond to that. Often people say, why don't you move out of downtown Toronto? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that save us some money? Probably no, but let's start with why that would be challenging. We really do need to be centrally located because the business that we're in is the regulatory sector. And so all of our peer organizations are here. The Ministry of Health is just down the street. and We inter interact with them a significant amount of time every year. And some of the oversight agencies that we also deal with, like the Office of the Fairness Commissioner, the Office of the Privacy Commissioner, they're all located here as well. Now, email and telephone are good for most of the time, but you really do need to have that face-to-face -to, -face to build those relationships and work through some challenging um, issues. Now, another consideration with that, though, is as far as a transportation hub, it's hard to beat Toronto. So council members, committee members, um, visiting um, jurisdictions from other provinces, it, it being centrally located means that everybody can actually get here. You know, the third thing is, although we've had very little staff turnover, when we recruit, we tend to recruit from the other regulators that are in the area, or we recruit from the Ministry of Health, people that are coming from policy background. So that means that if you move away from that, you're really distant from that, that pool, and it's hard to build the relationships that translate to getting good applicants for staff positions. So there's some very practical reasons for being where we are. To put um, some actual numbers around it, you know, we pay a very low rent. Uh, we, we are in a Class C building. Uh, the building that we're in 
it, it caters specifically to not-for-profit organizations and healthcare organizations. Some of the other tenants include the hospital for sick children. Hospitals don't have a lot, a lot of money to throw around, so they're looking for a good deal on rent. And uh, one of the other colleges, the College of Carabinus, is just down the hall. We pay an amount that is one of the lowest that you can get in Toronto. We did a review this last year prior to looking at a fee increase. Uh, we pay, well, we did some comparators. In the GTA, it's one of the lowest rates. That means that we couldn't move to Markham, Richmond Hill, we couldn't move to Etobicoke for anything cheaper. We looked at Hamilton, the other cities that are close by. Um, we are smack dab in the middle of the range that you see for downtown Hamilton. So it means that our rent is competitive, and if we were to move, it would be a very marginal savings at, at best. You know, our, our rent is 10% of our over annual budget. So if you think we reduce that by 10%, it's a 1% decrease that's going to not, that's not going to offset a fee increase. So moving isn't, it's not going to save us. Um, so yeah, we pay less rent than almost every other regulatory college and we really do need to be in Toronto. We get questions about staffing. And again, I think it's a fair question. But like I said earlier, we have very little, very low staff turnover. What that translates to is that we've got a core dedicated experience group of staff. For every comparable college in terms of size, we have at least four staff less than them. So we're leading in terms of staffing. In fact, for a knowledge-based organization, considering that less than our less than 50% of our overall budget is staffing, that's pretty low. So I don't think there's a lot of room to play there. If anything, we're likely to add one more staff member because of the increase in cases. Um, it's, it's investigations that we're outsourcing that I think we can probably do a cheaper if we brought somebody in. So um, the last, last piece on this, you'll notice on the bottom, that we did a salary review because we wanted to make sure that, again, before we were going to the membership and asking for a fee increase, we were ensuring that we weren't overpaying or we weren't underpaying. I mean, that's as important. So we're right on the benchmark. Uh, there were two positions that we were under, but by and large, we're on par with all of our all of our peers. So how do we compare? We've got two slides ready to look at here. This one looks at all of the other RT regulators in Canada. And so if you, if you look, the list is organized from west to east on the bottom. So we've always been the highest. Uh, with this, with this increase, will again be the highest on this. And again, uh, you know, this, this is there for you to help give you some perspective on this. Saskatchewan has just recently raised their fees to five hundred dollars. So that was our old fee. Saskatchewan has a registrar of one day a week. That's their only staff position. Um, they have much less, less infrastructure. They have a lot fewer RTs in the province as well. So that's that's going to require a little bit higher one, but. Our organization is much bigger, and so for the same fee, that's, that's actually pretty good. It's an indicator of how lean we typically have run. And then if we go to the next slide, this is an interesting one. So this will help. This is a comparator of uh, other colleges within Ontario. So within Ontario, what we did is we looked at, at all of them. Now, some that we cut out, we took CPSO out of there. We took pharmacy out. We, that. we looked at the other 23 colleges, and we ranked them. We went from highest amount to lowest amount. The highest amount was midwives at 1950 per year. The lowest was dental hygienists at $250 a year. Now, there's a, a range in size as well. So what we did is we looked at uh, our membership numbers from 2014. Uh, 3269 was the membership number we had there. And we went plus or minus 1,000 and figured those are the colleges that are closest to us in size. And so the very similar list, it's, it's speech language, it's the dietitians, it's us, opticians, optometry, and uh, traditional Chinese medicine, so TCM. If you look at that, purely on numbers alone, we fall smack in the middle, but we have by far the lowest budget. Now, the size of the college is only one indicator of what your costs are. If you think about those two bookends, midwives and, and dental hygiene, midwives, there's lots of complaints, lawsuits, and so on. So their legal costs are very high. In fact, they had a case that ran on close to two years in time, so you can just imagine how much that cost. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got dental hygiene at 250. Nobody, nobody files complaints against the hygienist. It's always against the dentist. So they have very few cases relative to you know, the, the mean. So that's going to drive some of their costs as well. So even if 
go back to the graph. Looking at the registration fee, when it was $500, yes, it was the lowest. Even when we raise it to $620, we're still only the second lowest of all of our peers. So hopefully that gives some perspective on, on where we are. So we're close to the end here. Um, the other fees, so just a couple of other points, the annual registration fee is still prorated. So as you know, um, you can join partway through the year and only pay for the remainder. You can also um, go inactive or you can uh, resign partly way through the year and we refund the remainder of the year as well. So that, that doesn't change. We increase the late penalty and the reinstatement fees proportionately to the fee increase. So those have gone up a bit. Application fees remain unchanged at $75. And the timing on this, March 2018, so not this year, next year. So we've got a year and a half before this will, this will come into play. That's when it's going to go live, proposed to go live. Some of you will know that we do have a fee stabilization fund. So that's been there for better part of 10 years. And it's there for a reason. Before we go to you, that completely dry. So that actually, remember, we're going to be in deficit as of 2017. That buys us the extra year. So it's 2018 that this will come into effect. And so that's that's it from us. Um, we'll open the floor for questions. And thanks for the last couple of people, but thanks to those of you who stayed on. Uh, the chat function is there. That's the shop function on your screen if you want to send in your questions. And uh, we'll be open for a half hour or so. Fire away. Is there anything that we haven't covered? Any other questions that you have? QA program revisions. Sure. Um, so I have a question that asks about the QA revisions. So we're certainly talking about this in the town hall. We're, um, we're pretty excited about this. I mean, I'll, I'll cover it as briefly as I can. As you know, uh, the QA program is on hold for this year. You know, if we ever want to see if people are reading our messages, we just have to sneak something in there like QA program, no random selection this year, or proposed fee increase. All of a sudden, everybody reads it and the message gets out so we know our communications are actually working. But we put on hold because, uh, let me back up. Current program has been in effect since 2004. Uh, there have been two periodic reviews. Every five years, we do a review of it. Some of the feedback that we re consistently received uh, really drove us to realize we needed to change the program. It's still been a change in philosophy. You know, when the college first opened, it was very much a, a quality assurance, almost policing approach. Uh, we're much more on the QI simple following, so you can achieve the same goals with different, different philosophy. So. When we redesigned this, what we wanted to do was make sure that it was easy, uh, that it was uh, applicable to all of the all of the different areas of practice in the profession, and uh, and so some of the structural things we we, we definitely wanted to address. So um, what the new program will look at, or sorry, will look like, it'll be based around still two things: the professional portfolio, so port and a review of professional standards. So again, there uh, be, well, I'll come back to selection. And see, going to get a little bit of a facelift. If you've been on it recently, you'll notice that, of course, we have the grow wheel in there, and you can assign your elements to grow. Um, so that's still going to be there. We're changing the language in it just slightly to make it broader in, in, you know, in terms of working for all the areas of practice. And there has to be some review, as the other component of the program, some review of professional standards. That's, so that's the legislation. So right now, uh, if we have, of course, you know we have a random selection, uh, and you know normally with a random selection you submit your portfolio and you can pick the PSA. No more PSA. Instead, everybody annually will complete a short e-learning module with the goal being completion, not pass or fail, and it's just going to be built around whatever's new from the year. So hot topics. So if, if by chance there's like legislative change new policies, new standards, those will all be covered in there. So if you missed it, you'll catch it at the end of the year. So that's really meant to help inform everybody about what's new and what's changed. Uh, we try to make it easier for you to put information into, uh, into your port or into your portfolio. So that's what the app is all about because uh, 
after a long day, the last thing that any of us want to do or will remember to do is open up your portfolio and enter the learning that you did over the day. The app allows you to do it right at the point of learning. So hopefully it's going to make it easier to put your information in there. Now, in terms of selection, we still have to have a selection process, but everyone's going to be on a schedule. So when we roll this out, and we're looking at starting in 2018, 2019, uh, when we roll this out, we're going to take a six-year rollout period. We'll just basically divide the membership into six parts. If you've been selected recently, you're at the end of it. If you've never been selected, so plan, <laughs> plan ahead. And then based on the results, you're either going to be scored at, at standard or below standard. If you're at standard, you're good for five more years. If you're below standard, work with you a little more closely, do another review in a year's time and work towards trying to keep up to that standard so you're good for another spell. So we think it's going to be well received. Feedback so far has been really good. I think it's a much more progressive and open and supportive program and we'll have lots more information coming to you on that. Okay, so there's another question coming in, and just to fill the air, uh, again, there's a survey for you to be able to complete at the end of this thing. It would be great if we could have some feedback on this. It has been recorded, so it will be on the website. Uh, give us a couple of days to get it up there. And uh, if you have any additional questions or thoughts that come to you afterwards, you know, put them in the survey or send them to us. And by all means, complete the survey if you can. We'd love to have the feedback. Uh, or you can, I've had lots of um, personal emails as well. So. Whatever you want to do to get us the, the information, we'll, we'll take it however it comes. Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions coming in, so let's say a last call. Last call for questions, and then we'll let you go. Okay, everybody. Well, thanks again, and uh, hopefully I'll see some of you at the town halls.